Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Managing Disruptive Change. Now, since we know that there are companies who got disrupted, companies who can adapt, and also there are disruptors on the market, we are trying to understand what disruption is. And having seen Clayton Christensen's idea of those incumbents who develop successfully in markets, making products better and better, but leaving room for entrance, it's important to understand that, that a little further. First, let's first of all look into academia a little bit and to the concept of the so-called structural inertia in order to understand that. If we start looking at that, we might want to look at IBM. IBM was a very successful company over the years, sometimes more successful, sometimes less successful, as we can see here. In the 80s, it was known as very successful. It was on the personal computer market. Um, their investments led to even four Nobel Prize winners. They were successful in, in selling mainframe computers. They, they, they did everything right. However, they started struggling in the 90s. They had a record loss of 8 billion US dollars in 1994 because at the very end, they didn't really see the change of the customer preference and purchasing decision making. So why is that? Why do companies that are really successful 10 years before struggle and at the very end are able to be successful later on? It's their slow adaption capability and low agility. So why are these companies slow in adapting? And this is a phenomenon. We look at these companies, large with many, many resources, and we ask ourselves, why do they miss something sometimes? Well, the answer is in the so-called structural inertia phenomenon, or in this theoretical perspective. Because in general, and this is what the theory says is, the very factors that make a system reproducible is the resistant to change. So these companies like an IBM are successful because they are first of all resistant to change. The processes get better and better. As Christensen said, if you want to develop as a large incumbent in the traditional market and take up the trajectory of the market development, you have to make your products better and better and better, which means better processes, better products, better everything. You need to have an attention to every detail. And this detail makes you successful. So what you basically depend on is your experience in what you do, is your type of activity in terms of having an attention to detail, having a focus on that everything is going right, and ideally having a, the size being big enough in order to use every advantage that an economies of scale can bring you. So incumbents are large organizations and subject to inertial forces depending on size, age, and type of activities. But this make incumbents very, very successful. Structures and processes are closely aligned with the current technology and are excellent. This is the operational excellence. Institutionalization and standardization yield to survival and to advantages, especially in times of stability. This is why a codec could be successful for 100 years. I mean, 100 years is, is a very long time, to be honest. That's why German car manufacturers are still successful, because the product quality is, is, is very much there. This is even why large hotel chains that uh, have very good products are successful, because there are still people who are able to pay for these expensive hotel rooms. However, what's the disadvantage? It's the lower agility. 
if you depend on your stable processes in order to make your existing business successful, you're not that agile, especially in times of radical technology change. And this is a very easy saying. And if we look into retrospective and, and we, if we pay attention to those companies and we say, Kodak, how could they ever miss this development? Nowadays, it's easy to say, how could they ever miss this development? But when they had to decide in that moment, what were really the forces in the market? What were the market developments there that might have been potential disruptors? And we can only try to understand that phenomenon by looking at a present example. Uh, we took the example of the automotive industry and uh, in, in the middle, in the focus of our example is, is Daimler. Daimler with Mercedes cars. Mercedes cars, some people say it's the best quality cars in the world. People buy Mercedes cars because they want to have best quality. Whether it is true or not, don't discuss it here. But Mercedes, and this is successful because they have the tradition of 100 years and more than 100 years building those cars with this exceptional quality. So it's the age. They are large enough in order to have lots of people who develop small parts. So they have hundreds of engineers who take care of just for the lighting. Do you really need it or not? Well, it's perfect. This is what makes them successful. This is what makes the people buy those cars. However, they face tremendous developments outside in the outside world in the automotive industry. It starts with Tesla and the new way of driving cars in terms of combustion engines versus electronic mobility versus or in addition hydrogen power and so on. There is no clear answer to that nowadays. Is it hybrid models? Well, people start buying hybrid models right now because they still have the higher range of, of going from A to B. Do we really need it? Probably not. Is it still the old combustion engine because we can work on new fuel design? Is it electronic cars, pure electronic cars? Or is it something else? And if you look at Toyota, they, they're going for something else, by the way, right now. So that's the first potential disruption. Do you know whether the, what is going to be the future? How people drive in the future? Electric, not, hybrid, whatever, in 5, 10, 20, 50 years? Well, I don't. The second is car sharing. People stop buying cars, especially in large cities. People don't need to have a car anymore. I mean, if you look at that, and it's just a study for for Germany, in Germany, people use their cars 4% of the time. 96% cars are just standing around, parking garage and so on. And, 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 and then you have to pay for the parking garage, by the way. So why don't you share your car? And why don't others share the car? So it's the car sharing idea which Uber uses which car sharing industry uses, big car sharing websites, and, 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 and so on. People stop buying cars, which puts pressure on the automotive industry to change the business model. It's not the cars being sold as a KPI in the future. It's probably something else. It's, it's the mile being driven or something like that. I don't know. Do you know? Well, there's more to that. Um, if you ask people what they complained in, in, in recent years, I have a cool mobile phone and, and Google Maps is actually giving me great traffic information. Why is it not the same in my car? I pay lots of money for my GPS system. However, it's not that good like Google Maps. So what's the connection? So there's pressure coming from those companies onto the traditional incumbents in the automotive industry. And not only because of Google Maps, but I said that Google is also doing all sorts of things, also because they're thinking about autonomous driving. 
and autonomous driving might be the future. I would love to sit in a car and just don't need to care about the driver and don't need to drive by myself. However, there are many people still who love driving. And especially if you look at, at the right side over here, um, BMW has, has a German slogan, Freude am Fahren, which is actually joy driving a car. Is it really fun driving a car if it's autonomous driving? No, people love to drive a car. At least some people love to drive a car. And this autonomous vehicle movement, also pushed by Baidu, um, is also threatening this industry. And there are all the others. The other incumbents who are working on other solutions threatening Mercedes. So if you were the CEO of, of Mercedes, what do you do at that moment? What is the real disruption for you? This is probably also the situation the Kodak people found themselves when they had to decide in the 70s, 80s. When the digital photography came up, but not only the digital photography, also probably different things in the market which we don't recall because they weren't important, but at that moment, you weren't able to say whether it, whether it was important or not. Same here. And this is why you have to have a differentiated view on what's happening around you. What is potentially disrupting my industry and what is potentially not? What is, might be just an innovation. Those companies are reacting so Daimler, BMW and Audi jointly acquire here, not to fall behind of Google, so keeping up with this Google Maps technology. Daimler launched Movil mobility platform integrating a car to go service, so um, this is basically reacting to the car sharing. They have autonomous buses in Amsterdam, so they react to autonomous driving. And actually, they just announced that a couple of days ago, they announced that they are also cooperating with Uber in autonomous driving. And Mercedes is working together with Tesla. If you look at the gear shift in some Mercedes models and Tesla model, it's the same. So they exchange technologies. So they react, they do something. However, what is really the disruptive factor? You can't react to everything. And if you especially look at, at other companies like VW, Audi, they react in a different way. How can they really react to everything? And especially VW, who have still a, a scandal and have to pay a lot of money for that scandal, which actually they don't have in order to react. What am I saying right now? What we saw is there were innovations. Some are disruptive, some are not. If we look in retrospective, we can always easily say Kodak didn't react. If we are in that situation right now, we cannot. I'm not able to say whether it's electronic mobility. What's the extent of autonomous driving? Do I need, really need this Google traffic in, in information? And so on. So I'm not able to say that. Maybe something new is coming up, which, which I, I didn't even see. New production mechanisms for electronic cars that might change the entire world, or the hydrogen technology comes up. So there might even be more. In that situation, it's difficult to say what to do. Leading to the point that you have to understand the disruption a lot more closely in order to understand how you can react to that. And if we look at those company examples which we had, these companies did not predict change adequately and adapted accordingly. Those were the companies who were likely to fail. However, it's always easy to say in retrospective, um, but it's more important that these companies would have needed, and every company nowadays needs a more systematic approach towards that problem. Kodak did not predict the strong rise of digital photography. Were they able to? Kind of see today. Ask yourself. Nokia, even though they were an early innovator in that entire business, mobile phones, they failed to focus on smartphones. 
Did they see it? Probably they saw it. Did they consider it a disruption? Maybe not. Remember the car industry. Blockbuster. They did not predict video on demand. They focused on core business instead. Actually, focusing on core business is, is, is what we also tell you in business school. Profit from the core. This is a very, very interesting idea and makes companies very successful. However, in the Blockbuster example, was wrong. And BlackBerry? BlackBerry, even though very successful with business smartphones, it failed to move to the bigger touch screen displays. They also focused on their core of security, but kept the old smartphones, which made them not successful. And again, to some extent, also some structural inertia, because they were successful with that technology in the future, and they were the best with that technology. They focused on that, which in that moment was wrong. But what do you do? Well, again, in, in retrospective, it's always easy to say this was the important disruption. If you're in that situation, you can't. So what you need is a more systematic approach. Companies are aware of disruptions in their industry. Everybody knows what's, what's, what's uh, going on in, in various industries. But they often struggle to understand the disruption using a systematic approach. Understanding the disruption, reacting in the right way to that. This is why we say you need a detailed, a structured approach where you can identify potential disruptions and then proactively manage them in the right way. And we'll see in the next chapters how this could go.